Okay. Okay, how's everybody doing today? Um, yes, we are live here. Just have to do one more thing here. It's getting stuff put together. Didn't quite get everything where I wanted it to be. So, that's okay. But, um, how's everybody doing tonight? And, um, as you can tell from the, um, the title, um, the audit. The audience explained the top secret. We're going to be going from Archangel to Blackbird tonight. Now, many people probably know what the Blackbird is, but not too many people know about Archangel, which came before the Blackbird. But in order to understand where this came from, we have to go back to the plane guys before that. Yes, these are all airplanes. It was the U-2 Dragon Lady. Um, there was an incident over Russia. It was May 1st, 1960. Uh, Francis Gary Powers was flying his U-2 over Russia. Got shot down from a surface-to-air missile. And um, he was captured. And he was sentenced to two years in prison and seven years hard labor. But he was later released two years after that in a prisoner exchange for a Russian spy. So, but um, the United States at that time kind of realized that the U-2, which only flew at Mach 0.08, uh, was not going to be the answer that they were looking for to know what was going on with Russia. Uh, there was one other problem, though, with the whole Gary Powers deal. Hey, Josh. Um, when Gary Powers got shot down, it was two weeks before a major meeting between uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower and Nikita Khrushchev at Camp David. So that kind of muddled the works there a little bit. So... Gary gets shot down. America's like, okay, we need to do something about this. So, and before I go any further, let me go into share screen here while I'm talking. Um, we need to build something that is faster. There we go. Just to give you an idea of the plane that, would, that uh, Gary Powers was in. As soon as it decides to come up, and it's not coming up. <laughs> okay, it's thinking here. I'm asking to do too many things here, so let me remove this here for right now but um they need something that flew higher flew faster and by the time the russians knew it was there it was gone literally this is where archangel comes in so okay there we go now we're cooking with gas so let's go back in here. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. Things are going a little bit easier now. Okay, this here, that is the YouTube Dragon Lady that I was talking about, and that is indeed Francis Gary Powers standing next to it. Um, when the picture was taken, whether it's before or after he got shot down, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, the Russians captured him, cap captured our spy plane, so things needed to change. So about 19... Actually, the, the Archangel was in development actually from 1959 before he was shot down. It, things got accelerated, but there was an open contract. Well, I say open contract. There was an open um, competition. It ended up being, I believe, Convair and Lockheed got a direct competition for it. Um, Convair with the B-58 Hustler ran into some problems um basically they kind of blew the deadline and went, went way over budget where lockheed had a, had um, experience with black programs and they built the u2 and when they built the u2 they they got it finished before under budget so they lockheed got tapped to do the archangel too which that's designed at one so was kind of that is the archangel now if you look at the archangel as opposed to the sr-71 blackwood you notice that one's white uh archangel had an aluminum skin uh was not the greatest but it was the same platform that the sr-71 came from <clears throat> And the thing with, between this plane and the SR-71 Blackbird, Blackbird is this plane was slightly faster. Uh, we're going to do a little comparison between the two here in a minute. But um, these were not commissioned by the U.S. Air Force. These were actually commissioned by the CIA, who had very close in interest in some of the things going on. Uh, they used these over Russia. They flew these over Viet, uh, the early years of Vietnam. SR-71 also seen some Vietnam action. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Um, also seen a little bit of action in the Middle East, as well as other theaters. A lot, a lot that the Archangel did is still classified. There's more stuff classified with that yet than there is the SR-71 Blackbird. So, as we're doing this here, uh, there's there's design competition. Lockheed came up with this. Uh, this plane could actually fly about Mach 3.5. The Blackbird, Mach 3.35. So, this plane was a little bit shorter, a little bit faster, a little bit lighter, and could fly a little bit higher. Um, it was a very good platform. But the problem was there's only one person flying it. Now, um, between all between the variants of this, and all these came from Project Oxcart, but all the Oxcart variants, none of them ever got shot down. The closest one ever got to getting shoot ever got to getting shot down was a missile exploded 91 meters off the tail. They actually found shrapnel from the missile lodged in one of the flaps. But as I said, this plane was aluminum. Had a t I do believe it had a titanium airframe in it, though. And with the Archangel, the YF-12, which we're, we're going to get into here in a little bit, the D-21 uh, D drone and the SR-71 Blackbird, who was built entirely of titanium, well, funny story about that. The titanium actually came from Russia, the people we were spying on. But the CIA couldn't just dial up Russia's. Yeah, we need some titanium so we can build a spy plane so we can look at you. 
So the CIA had this elaborate underground thing dealing through these people that are dealing with the Russians to get the titanium to build the airframe for the SR-71 Blackbird. And this plane here, the A-12 Archangel. But it was highly successful. Um, the, Ru uh, the Russians talked about it. And what the Russians were saying was when it came up on the radar, because every time that radar sweep around, and if, if you see like a radar screen, there's that round circle, and the line that goes around is which way the radar is facing as it turns. Well, it has to blip about, it has to blip at least three times so you can get a lock on to shoot a missile at it. The SR-71 only blipped the radar usually only twice. That's how fast it went because... It'd sweep, it'd be here, it'd come around, sweep again, it'd be here, and the third sweep, gone. So the, the Russians didn't even know what was going on when that plane was going over. They just know it was fast, very fast. Um, no, the A-12 Archangel did not carry any armament on it whatsoever. Uh, the YF-12, on the other hand, which was a prototype was made to be a bomber interceptor and had what was it aim 40 i think blue this aim 47 or aim 45 falcon yeah aim 47 falcon air-to-air -air missiles on it so it can intercept bombers coming into american soil now um the yf-12 also carried the D-21 drone. Let's see if I can get to the picture. See what the next picture is here. Okay. That is a y, that is a YF-12, which as soon as it carried the drone, it became an M M-21 carrying the drone on its back, which is a D-21. Uh, the drones, which were also part of this program. Come on. There it is. The drones that are also part of this program um, were programmed to fly a predetermined course and use its reconnaissance instruments to take pictures. Had a had a um, high res had a high resolution camera in it, so it'd fly over, take its pictures, fly back out of their airspace, drop the camera, and the drone was self destruct. In theory. Uh, we lost one of those drones over China. Oh, that's cool. That's cool, Josh. That's cool. So we lost one of the drones over China. Um, nothing. It was an incident, but not really that big of an incident. So um, with that being said, the YF-12 prototype, they only built three of them were pretty much shelved. Um, they turned into trainers for the SR-71, which had two cockpits. Had the cockpit here, but I also had a raised cockpit off to the side for a trainer to sit in. So if they had to eject, they could both eject safely. Um, but we're getting into the SR-71 Blackbird now. Okay, here's a, the... Um, a12, which they, they call it Oxcart, as as Archangel, but Oxcart is the project that these came from. Now, if you look at the comparison, the silhouette on the right on the left side is the A12. The silhouette on the left on the right side, sorry, is the SR71 Blackbird. You'll see that the A12 is slightly shorter, and We'll go down through everything here. Um, the length, 101 one foot 9 inches, as opposed to the SR-71, 107 foot 5 inches. Uh, wingspan would be 55 feet 5 inches for the A-12, 55 feet 7 inches for the SR-71 Blackbird. So I did share that. Uh, maximum in weight flight, 120,000 pounds for the A-12. Uh, 140,000 pounds for the SR-71 Blackbird. Fastest documented or official speed. 
2,208 miles an hour for the A12, 2,193 miles an hour for the SR-71 Blackbird. Both of them flew a lot faster. Not a lot, but they flew faster than that. That was undocumented. Maximum test altitude, 90,000 feet for the A-12, 85,069 feet for the SR-71 Blackbird. Um, unofficially, they both could fly theoretically 100,000 feet. Uh, unrefueled range, 3,000 miles for the A-12. This is where the SR-71 is a little bit better. 3,250 miles unfueled for the SR-71 Blackbird. Neither one of them carried armament. The A-12 had a crew of one. The SR-71 had a crew of two. Now, um, the person in front of the SR-71 was the pilot. He just took care of all the flying. Um, a little bit of it. Not even really the navigation. The backseater did that. The backseater uh, monitored radios, did navigation, and took all the pictures. The only thing that the pilot did was fly the plane. Um little side note on these, they used to call the SR-71 the sled. And somebody who flew the SR-71 was called a sled driver. And that's because um, the way it flew. Um, the A-12 or the SR-71 Blackbird, you could not stand it on its wingtip and fly it. You be Hey, Christy. Um, the SR-71... Either one of those planes, the A-12 or SR-71, you can only go like maybe 30 degrees in a bank. If you went any further, it would stall and fall out of the air. Same thing if you went to climb. You can only climb, I think, upwards of 25 to 30 degrees of climb or dive. You couldn't dive it straight down because you lose all control. And if you, if you went up over 25, I think it's 25 degrees in a climb, it goes to stall and fall out of the air. So you, you had to have, to have the thing pointed into the air at all times. And as level as, as, level as you could possibly get it. But um, the one thing about both of these planes is the way the engines were made is once it got to altitude and you hit the ramjet, the faster it went, the more efficient it got. So if you're using a certain amount of fuel going, like let's say, Mach 2.7, Actually, when you get the Mach 3.35, you're going to be using less fuel. It's just the faster you want, the more efficient it got. And that's because if you look back to fuselage, you'll see there's two cones sticking up. In fact, let me see if I can get to another picture here to give you a better idea. Okay, that is the YF-12. If you look at the engine intake, you see those cones? They'll start sucking those cones back, and as they're sucking the cones back, the engine starts to become more efficient. And the reason they do that is that as when you get to altitude, they'll start pulling those cones back, trying to get as much air to ram through that ramjet as possible. The other thing those, co those cones do is help accelerate the air, which is another reason why it became more efficient. Um, especially that these things could cruise at Mach 3.2 all day long. Um, one thing people did not know about the SR-71 Blackbird, though, is, and you can see a little bit of it on this picture with the Y-12, because this, one, this one's a um, titanium job because it has the black paint on it, is if you look back where the red lines are behind the cockpit, you'll see what looks like streaks going back to wing. That's actually fuel. Uh, when they started making these out of titanium, what they had to do was actually have gaps where the fuel would go. So when the airframe started heating up, it would expand and seal those gaps. If they had that sealed from the get-go, when it actually heated up, it actually would blow itself apart. So it there was acceptable fuel loss to, to got up to speed and got the airframe heated up and everything expanded and sealed itself off. Um, I kind of found that rather interesting. Now, um, consulting my notes here. 
the SR-71 Blackbird, as I said, it was flown over just about every enemy you could think of, including the Middle East. Um, the SR-71 uh, crews flew three consecutive missions. Uh, usually you do like a mission a week and you're done. They flew three days in a row and they kept the plane in the air. Well, actually, they kept the plane in the air for like three days. Uh, they just, they come out, refuel, fly back over, come out, refuel, fly back over. But they did three missions like that consecutively. And they're the ones who provide the information for us to get Gaddafi. Um, they were flown over to Yom Kippur. Was that the Yom, Yom Kippur War? Or... But the idea of that was, is they flew over because there's a ceasefire called. And the president at the time, I think it was Nixon, I think, I can't remember which president was in during Yom Kippur, wanted to know if everybody's where they said they'd be. Did, and they weren't. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm not saying anything to either one of you two. You guys got to get to where you said you were going to be. But um, it kind of showed the, the power that that plane wielded. That plane, when the SR-71 came out, it couldn't be touched. Um, there are stories from the pilots when they're flying over Russia that they would scramble jets trying to intercept it. They said, we can see the jets coming up. They'll be coming right up ahead of us. And we see them get up like maybe so far, and they would just fall, literally fall out of the air. They, they couldn't, the SR-71 could could not be touched. The only thing that flew faster than it was a um, surface-to-air missile. But, as I said, the plane flew so fast that the missile could not get a definite lock on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think he's seen seen this plane flying over. Probably flew over about eighty five thousand to ninety thousand feet, but um, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, but uh, those are like the, some of the critical missions that the SR seventy one did. Um, but some of the other things that the SR seventy one did that nobody knew was um they found on one of the missions it was just kind of like a calling because they just happened to find find it and they called in the guy's coordinates they found a guy lost at sea out in the middle of nowhere i, I think they said the closest ship to this guy was probably over 300 miles away and they found this guy floating around in the middle of the ocean uh they found a climber on mount mckinley that was lost so it, it did do some hit him humanitarian work as well not ask for work it just happenstance but they these pilots did that too um they monitored on one of their flights they had there's a uh, volcano that erupted and they were taking pictures of the volcanoes they were flying by they did their mission and actually had to turn around and come back out and was on the whole way out, they're just taking pictures of this volcano as, as it's erupting. Uh, and they sent the data to uh, the USGS. So, I mean, it did all kinds of weird things. Um, oh, yeah, I'm probably toward the end of this. I may have a little bit of a um, two or three question quiz for you for you guys here. So, something, something for you to get a giggle over. But... Um, it's a very amazing aircraft. Um, and another thing, I'm probably going to share a video here, too, of the L.A. speed incident. The L.A. speed incident was absolutely hysterical. Uh, they call it the L.A. speed check, but most people call it the L.A. speed incident. Um, and the person telling the story is none other than Major Brian Schul. The pilot of the plane that did this, along with his uh, co-pilot, co or his backseater, uh, Walter 
was it Walter Wilson? Yeah, Walter uh, Watson. Uh, the very funny story. Uh, everybody thinks there's something serious that happened, but uh, it's the other thing I'm going to say before I play, and I'm probably going to play here in about 15, 20 minutes. It's nothing but a verbal game of one up upsmanship where the SR-71 had the final word. But um, there were some speed records. Um, I believe it was from L from um, Beale to L.A. Or was it from New York to L.A.? Yeah, from New York to L.A., I'm sorry. On a prescribed course where the SR-71 flew across the United States in one hour and 15 minutes. That's the official. Uh, one of the books I have on the SR-71 Blackbird. Um, straight line, full afterburner, full tilt. Covered that same distance in 45 minutes. 45 minutes to cover that. That's unofficial. <laughs> but um, one of the things that kind of that plagued it, not problem-wise to the crew, Problem was for anybody in the flight path when it was going supersonic and it wasn't quite up there, wasn't up at altitude yet, was um, sonic booms. Uh, this thing at about 45 to 50,000 feet would produce a sonic boom that'll blow the windows out of the building. <laughs> and that's at 45,000 feet. Uh, imagine lower, 30,000 feet. I mean, you're it was doing some, some considerable damage. But um, at that time, though, speed was as, was of the essence. Um, the one thing the YF-12 was, and we're going to back up a little bit, the YF-12 was somewhat a suitable deterrent for Russia launching a nuclear strike with bombers on the United States. Now, at that time, though, people think they're going to drop bombs. Actually, they were dropping ICBMs. They didn't have, Russia did not have the technology to hit the West Coast. They, they could fly over Canada and hit northern United States, but they couldn't hit the West Coast from where their missile bases were without flying out in the international waters and dropping them from a bomber. The YF-12, the reason why it was deterrent is once it got up in the air and got up to speed, it can close the ground down and knock those bombers out of the sky before those bombers ever knew what hit them. Battery! That's my phone. So with something like that, um it's hard to it's hard to um let anybody mess with you if you will now they all got decommissioned and they're all sitting in different um museums around the world there's, there's an sr 71 in the smithsonian is um in the smithsonian in the air and space museum there's also one out at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base out by Dayton, Ohio, along with another plane that I'm just going to touch on. I may do an episode on it later on. Um, I think there's one on an aircraft carrier in New York and also one on an aircraft carrier in Los Angeles. But um, there were quite a number of them built. Um, A-12 through the SR-71 Blackbird. A lot of the A, some of the A-12s did become SR-71s. They, they were basically the same airframe, just slightly lengthened out a little bit to accommodate two cockpits instead of one. So that and YF-12 as well. Um, in fact, I think there's one, I can't remember where it's at, but there's one that has an A-12, a YF-12, and the SR-71 
all sitting there, and I think they have one of the drones, too. But a, a very interesting plane, a very interesting story. I know I probably didn't do it justice, but um, it's something to behold. I mean, if you have something here. Now, this is Mach 3 with an air-breathing jet, not a rocket. That's a jet. With the technology of time, um, they flew the SR-71, I do believe, up into the 90s. And its record still has, hasn't been broken for a plane that was originally designed in the early 60s. And it still can't be beat by anything that we know of yet, uh, which is going to be another topic. Because there is a supposed SR-72 uh, codenamed Aurora, which also uses an air-breathing jet, but it's a different style. A bug just land over here. It's a different style of jet. It's called scramjet. And these things can go hypersonic. Um, we're talking anywhere from Mach 5.5 to Mach 7, maybe even faster than that. In a higher altitude. Um, just a little quick, quick deal on that is... Uh, Late 90s into about 2010, uh, many people report seeing a contrail that was what they call donuts on a rope. There's a straight line contrail, but every so many feet along this contrail, there was a round puff of smoke that went the whole way around the contrail. And what the scramjet is, it's like a pulse jet. Instead of being constant, it's like a series of explosions coming out, and every one of those donuts was one of those explosions on that contrail. But I said, that's going to be for another time as well. Let's stop that screen because that's all the pictures I got. So, But um, hopefully you learned something about this. Um, kind of hoping more people would show up too, but it is what it is. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. See if I can get this queued up here. I'm the guy. No, no, you didn't hear him. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to let Major Brian Scholl tell you the story of the L.A. speed incident or the L.A. speed check. See if I can get into the share screen here. Do, 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 do. Actually, that's what I want right there. But it is actually a very funny story. So I'm going to tell you the story, because you'll see this on the internet. People ask, was it ever fun to fly the jet? And I told this story one time in Seattle 20, 25 years ago, and it became, you know, this is urban legend or something. It's all true. One day, Walter and I are doing a little training mission around the United States, where you take off out of Sacramento, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, rip out over LA, up to Seattle, Back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. <laughs> then you do it backwards, and you're just gaining time and experience with your backseater. You're just learning how to work together. Building hours. Well, we're on our last training mission. We've made the turn into Albuquerque. We're over Tucson. I can see downtown LA from Tucson. 
I can see the whole western United States bathed in a warm glow of fall afternoon. Six in the evening, radios are silent, the air is smooth, not a gauge moving in my cockpit. It is perfect. I can see the whole chain of the Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico, and I'm going to be sitting all this scene, and it's all perfect. And I'm thinking, we bad. And I feel sorry for Walter because he has to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flip the switch up, and those of you that fly know that what I'm about to say is true, that centers that control all the traffic, when you fly on United or Delta and all the centers are controlling you, Albuquerque Center, LA Center, Seattle Center, Cleveland Center, Jacksonville Center. It all sounds like the same guy because they all talk really cool. They want to make you feel cool as a pilot. So they don't just talk normal. And I, I swear it's the same guy, but we kind of like it. So whenever you ask them a question, you're going to get talked to like you're somebody important. Those of you that fly Cessna's on know that, hey, uh, that sounds cool. Well, we flip up the switch, and sure enough, this is in the pre-GPS days. People always want to know their ground speed because they get lost, but they, they got to get their position. And who knows? There's always some Cessna guy. It's got to know his ground speed. The LA Center or so, Cessna November Alpha Tango. You got a ground speed radio for us? Now, Center would like to say, hey, pal, who cares? Get our frequency. We got other things. But no, he's going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. Says the November Alpha, we show you 90 knots, nine, zero knots on the ground. That's how they talk, I'm not making this up. Right after that, a twin bonanza popped up to pimp the guy, I guess. Uh, they had a twin beach, uh, whatever, you got a ground speed readout for us, Senator? Senator, if you're probably thinking, God, it's Friday afternoon, why me, God, please go with my No, he's going to talk to him like he's, you know, a shuttle astronaut. Twin Beach, we show you 120, 120 knots on the ground. Right after that, a Navy F-18 out of Lemoore popped up on frequency. And you knew it was a Navy guy because <clears throat> he talked very cool on the radio. <laughs> Center Dusty 52 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. Dusty 52 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar F-18 cockpit. Got it right there in the heads up display. Got it right there. And get, why are we calling center to broadcast our speed? Oh, I get it. We're just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping across Death Valley. And we want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little glee in the controller's voice, like just, just touch like we've put an end to this. Testify to we show you 620, 620 knots across the ground. And it was that across the ground, see that, that was that little, we've had enough of this, I don't want to hear anybody else now. And there was silence on the radio. There wasn't an airliner from Seattle or San Diego that wanted to be next on frequency, just an etiquette thing. And a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, Walter's in charge of the radio. So that, no, it's the Navy. They must die. They must die now. I thought, no, but if I do that, I'll destroy all the training. And I, I want us to be a good crew. And I, at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. <laughs> in his very best innocent Cessna voice, Walter, uh, LA Center, Aspen 30, have you got a ground speed readout for us? You can almost hear a collective gasp on freak from everyone. They call the poor fools and you hear the previous transmissions. And Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,942 knots across the ground. It was like a little glee in this voice. And I knew he was going to like Walter for the next four years is when he came back and said, Senator, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know we never heard another transmission all the way to the coast. So for just a moment, it indeed was a fun flying the jet. Most of the missions were highly serious, fatiguing, dangerous, scary, and very rewarding for what we were able to do. We, Berlin Wall came down on our watch. Uh, Gaddafi was silenced on our watch. And we saw the Soviets uh, flail 
Uh, Randy knew how to use this airplane and used it well. We were proud, proud to uh, do it. So okay, and that's that. But uh, yeah, the LA, that's the LA speed check. And um, I've heard other people talk about it that, or what they thought it was. That is the true story of the LA speed check. Yeah, it was. It's just like, <laughs> I have the baddest piece of military hardware in the air today. Oh, no, I don't. Oh. <laughs> But uh, that is probably one of the funniest stories, and that was the pilot that was flying the SR-71 when that happened, as you can, as you can tell. Um, about Major Brian Schul, um, one of the very interesting things about him, which I may do a, I might do an episode on him, just with his story, or it, better yet, Look up uh, um, LA Speed Check. There'll be one, one like a video, two down, and you'll see him standing in front of like a gold thing. And I think the video is like an hour or something long, but it's the video is worth watching because he was a Vietnam fighter pilot that got shot down, got severely burned, got rescued. He did. He didn't end up in Hotel Hanoi. He got rescued, but he spent. I think a year, a year and a half, recovering from his burns. They said, you'll never fly again, you'll never do this again, you'll never do that again. And not only did he fly again, he flew probably the baddest plane in the sky. And um, Colonel, Wal um, Colonel Walter uh, Watson, I do believe, was the first man of color to be a backseater. That did the navigation and the communication and everything else in the back seat. So he was he was a man of color, and somebody was told he'd never do this again. And well, yeah, he can, and he excelled at it. But um, some little um, what? How can I do this? Some little useless trivia for you coming coming from this because as as I said, we started the Dragon Lady or the U two spy plane that Francis Gary Power got got shot down with. A little interesting factoid because there's not enough people here to really do a, a quiz. Um, when they built the U two, no, I'm sorry, not when they built it. When they decommissioned the, uh, some of the U twos, uh, NASA had two of them upgraded. They are now ER-2s, and they use them for atmospheric research. NASA will actually fly these things over hurricanes. I don't blame them. You're going, even a, a, fight, a Navy pilot, was he a fighter pilot or just a um, transport or... Because there's a couple of fighter pilots I talked to. Is that yeah, they tried giving us a desk, desk job? I'm just like, I'm sorry. I'm used to going Mach two, not zero. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> but um, yeah, NASA has, and they still fly them. Um, U two actually still gets pulled out and used, not sparingly. It actually gets used a decent amount right now. Um, I'm still kind of curious about. Ooh, sub hunter, nice, nice. But they they still use the U two every now and again. The SR seventy one is pretty much mothballed at this point, for right now. Um, another little interesting fact about the SR seventy one Blackbird though is. They were already in museums as of September 11th, 2001. After that happened, George Bush went to the military and says, how fast can we have those things up in the air? Uh, none of them ever moved. So that wasn't feasible. Um, and the, reason, the reasoning behind um, 
decommissioning the SR-71 Blackbird is they supposedly had, well, not supposedly, they did have satellites that can do the job better than that, that, that that plane could do. And the planes weren't needed anymore. The problem with the satellite is, is they only pass over every so often. Uh, you can you can time a satellite with your watch, but when it's only over your target area for two minutes before it's out of the area again, you almost have to wait about five, six hours for it to come back around. The SR-71 can hit that same target area, get all the information you needed the whole way through. Usually one pass, sometimes we'll have to swing around and come back, back across again. So, in, in a maximum of two passes, you got all the information you need in between the first pass and the second pass, maybe an hour has elapsed. Um, the SR-71 actually has a worse turning radius than a Boeing 747. It's a bad plane, but <laughs> don't turn. a 747 can turn tighter than an SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, they said that if, if you need to make a U-turn, you better plan for about three states, literally. If, and that's the that's turning at speed. I'm sure if you chop the power on it, you could probably get to turn a little bit tighter. So it'd be a, almost the same as a, as a uh, sum 47. But still, you considerably have to chop the power, and you couldn't bank it. And so you can only bank about 30 degrees. Once you got beyond 30 degrees, it just fall right out of the air. Um, there were SR 71s lost. Uh, all of them that were lost were lost due to mechanical or pilot error. Mechanical failure or pilot error. Uh, as I reiterate, none of them were ever shot down. Another little interesting factoid. Now, we're talking about the A-12, the YF-12, and the SR-71 Blackbird, which is a Mach 3 plus airplane. Did you know? that there was one other plane, they only built two of them, that could hit Mach 3. They both flew. The first one actually hit Mach 3. The second one only ever hit Mach 2.75. Those were the North American XB-70 Valkyries. It was a Mach 3 bomber that it was a good idea at the time. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, they built two of them. It was a good idea for a time, but they kind of decided that a Mach 3 bomber was a little bit, it was pretty much impractical. Um, They're thinking about using it to deliver um, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I'm gonna be doing probably a full episode on this sometime in the, in the future. But um, that's about the only plane in the American inventory or any inventory in the world that can even hold a candle to the SR-71 Blackbird. That almost, if it was successful, um, I do believe it was the first one that crashed because of a um, tail fin vortex deal that sucked an F-105 Starfighter and sucked it literally right down to the backbone of the plane. Sending, but killed the fighter pilot. Uh, the pilot of the Valkyrie <laughs> Oh, they do that a lot. I, there's videos on YouTube about them doing that all the time and they're doing they're doing the speed of sound about a hundred feet off the deck, about maybe about a quarter mile off the um, off the carrier. I was, I was watching some of those, and I, the one guy was going supersonic, and he's going so fast, it's so low that he's actually sucking the water up, sucking the water vapor up off off the ocean. It's hysterical. I'm like that, I like to see. But um, 
Yeah, the XP70 Valkyrie is another very interesting story that almost, if it's successful, is, is going to take on the Concorde for supersonic transport. We almost had a Mach 3 airliner. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I know, like, I don't know if we're going to have an air show this year or not, but the last time I went to the air show before the pandemic, I was wearing, people thought I was crazy, but I was right up on a flight line. Well, not on a flight line, but I was as close as I could get to the runway where they're doing the air show at. Uh, they, were, they had uh, F-22s there, um, F-15s, a uh, bunch of Huey Cobras. That was that was kind of neat to watch. Uh, a uh, Galaxy C5, and they're doing all their little things there. And every time a plane would go by, people were sticking their oh, the Thunderbirds are there too. But there's people were sticking their fingers in their ears. And I had my I had my um, shooting muffs on. I just put my shooting muffs on. I was sitting there with the camera. Oh, that was a good time. So um, hopefully you guys, hopefully y'all found this interesting. Um, I'm willing to do another one. I'm going to still kind of, you know what? No, I think I'm just going to decide on a topic right now. The next next one's going to be, since this is kind of like a coast-to-coast -coast thing here, um, West Virginia's other monster. Yeah, there's more than West Virginia than just the Mothman. Let's just put it that way. We're going to cover the, the lesser known one first before we get into, uh, into the um, into um, Mothman. Oh, yeah. yeah. The SR-71 and all its little siblings always fascinated me. Absolutely fascinated me. Um. The thing with, how do I want to put this? The thing with the SR-71 Blackbird is nobody really knew what it was until it got decommissioned and started hitting. They had actually, all the ones that you see in the museums actually flew there first. Took them apart, put them in a the museum. If if it was like a like Smithsonian or a Wright Patterson Air Force Base, they actually just landed there, threw it in the hangar. There you go. But uh, another little interesting fact about the SR seventy one when they, when they went to start it, it originally started. I think each engine took a power bank. No, it took each jet engine took two power banks and each one of those power banks was powered by what they call buick nail head it was a buick 422 cubic inch slightly hopped up i think each each one of those motors are pushing about four four to four hundred fifty horse a piece driving a generator over driving a generator to start the to start the jet engines and um, during the during the later years, and this is with the U two and the SR seventy one Blackbird. Well, not so much with the Blackbird, really with the U two. Uh, the U two has what they call bicycle landing system. Instead of having wheels way out here in the back and like nose gear, it has two wheels about literally about that far apart from nose gear, and in the back, the gear is the same width. So it's your your front and your rear landing gear are on the same plane. So in order to help these U two the U two pilots land, um, late sixties early seventies, the CIA actually used Plymouth Superbirds. They would run two Superbirds and run beside as fast as they could go beside the U two, and they would would report in which about how far the wingtips are off the ground because these you two had an enormous wingspan and just a little bit one way a little bit the other you're dry you're dragging the wingtip on the ground 
Yeah, that's where those pressure suits came from. And what that what the pressure suit did was it pushed the blood blood supply up, and the, the, where the pilots were get running the problems of blocking out, they'd actually start losing the blood supply to their head. So when it's go to a high G turn, it press on the legs and press press up the torso, and that would keep the blood up in the head. But still, that that only lasted so long. If you stay in that high G turn too long, still you'd still pass out. But it's a lot. You you have to be going harder and faster to do that than you were before. Um, yeah, th because there's um. I can go on and on about airplanes, to be honest with you. I mean, if you want to go back before U-2, there was, I believe it was the P-41 Nighthawk. It was a twin boom, twin engine. No, sorry, P-41 Black Widow was one of the first reconnaissance aircraft that was also a night fighter during World War II. So, I mean, that, we have a long history with reconnaissance-style aircraft. Uh, and with reconnaissance style aircraft, and this is another one I'll probably do an episode on, was a B-17 called Old 666. That was his tail number, was 666. Uh, they had to do some uh, recon reconnaissance mission over the Bogan Islands. So in order to do the reconnaissance mission and keep the Japanese off of them, uh, they didn't carry any bombs, but every bit of weight they could strip out of it they did and they added the weight back into it with guns this plane had 17 guns sticking out of it and when it flew for constant's mission i think that plane actually shot down about 20 zeros when it did its mission and it made it back it completed the mission and made it back it wasn't exactly a one piece but it did it So, there's that in a nutshell. I don't really have anything else. Do so you all have anything? But, uh, yeah, the next episode is going to be uh, the Flatwoods Monster. And don't forget, I also have another live stream that's going to be Friday at 8 o'clock. So, I... I'd like to see you there. Now, the, the Friday live stream is just my normal live stream, not um, uh, the odd, unexplained, and top secret. <clears throat> so I'd like to see you there. Um, don't really have a topic for that one yet, but I'm probably going to be coming up with one here. Oh, thank you, Christy. But I'll probably have one come up with a, um, a, a topic for Friday, probably tomorrow night. I'm probably going to set it up tomorrow night, to be honest with you. So um, keep an eye out for that. And I'm trying to think what else. Oh, yes. Just a little, little bit of quick um, uh, housekeeping here. Uh, Sunday, I'm going to end the contest for my 500 subscriber giveaway. Um, there's a video where I announce it. Uh, if you want to be in a 500 subscriber giveaway, what you have to do is you have to like that video. Um be subscribed and share it out someplace on social media, whether you have a community page or a community tab on in your YouTube, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter, what have you. But what, what I want you to do is that when you share it out, I want you to provide a link um, with your comment on that video when you share it out. So that's, you have to satisfy those three things. And once you satisfy those three things, you're in the contest. After that contest is over, we're going to go into a Dollar Tree. I know everything a Dollar Tree now is a dollar twenty-five. That's okay. Um, or a dollar store, if you will. Fishing lure challenge. Um, what you have to do is you have to make your fishing lure off the things you buy in there. Except for like your split rings, if you use them to put to mount your hook, hooks you don't have to get from there, and like paint, paint or sealant or what have you. But 
your main item that you make your fishing lure out of has to come out of there. So I think that's going to be kind of fun. But um, that's all I got for you guys tonight. So I thank y'all for coming. Love y'all. And I'll see y'all on Friday. See ya.